Collecting American political items perhaps began in 1789 with the unanimous election of our nation's founding father, George Washington. A small metal button stamped with the initials GW and the words Long Live the President was a tangible show of support of Washington during his presidency and a highly prized collectible political item ever since. While the traditional campaign button is less popular in our modern digital age, it once was a primary means of demonstrating one's support for a political candidate or cause. Theodore Roosevelt began campaigning for elective office at the age of 23, winning the first of three terms to the New York Assembly in 1881. In his political life, he campaigned for mayor of New York City, governor of New York, the vice presidency, and the presidency in 1904 and 1912. As one of America's most popular politicians, TR's numerous campaigns generated an astonishing number and variety of political items that continue to inspire collectors of American political memorabilia. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, Tom Peeling, one of the nation's leading collectors of Theodore Roosevelt items. Hello, and welcome to the Talk About Teddy podcast, weekly conversations exploring the world of Theodore Roosevelt. I'm your host, Kurt Skinner, and I'm joined as ever by my good friend and co-host, Larry Marple. Hey, Larry, could you tell our listeners about today's guest? Hello, Kurt. Those in the world of collecting Theodore Roosevelt memorabilia probably know the name Tom Peeling. He's a graduate of Penn State University with a double major in journalism and history. He began work as a reporter at the Pocono Record in Pennsylvania in late 1978, and within two years he was promoted to the Sunday editor. He started work at the Palm Beach Post in Florida in 1985 as a copy editor on the news desk and retired in 2018 from the Post as news editor. Tom began collecting political items in 1972, specializing in Theodore Roosevelt as early as 1989. His collection of Theodore Roosevelt memorabilia is considered one of the best in the country. It includes nearly a thousand campaign buttons, ribbons, and other lapel devices, as well as hundreds of other items. He serves as president of the Theodore Roosevelt chapter of the American Political Items Collectors, the APIC. He's currently the editor of the quarterly magazine called The Keynoter for the APIC. He lives in North Carolina, where he, along with his wife, Becky, are the owners and operators of Walnut Ridge Farms. Tom Peeling, hello and welcome to the Talk About Teddy podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, uh, Tom, to get us started, I guess uh, the, the first natural question here would be, uh, how did you come to be interested in the first place in uh, collecting political memorabilia and maybe uh, TR memorabilia in, in particular? Well, I started collecting uh, political campaign buttons in 1972. I had a friend who was a year older than I was, so he was he was driving at age 16, and I was 15, and we went to a campaign headquarters for Nixon, where we were living in West Palm Beach, Florida, and they said, "Yeah, we've got a bunch of buttons here. We'll give you some buttons, but you got to work for them. You got to make a few phone calls to people, you know, to get out the vote for Nixon." So we sat down at the phones for I don't know what it was, half hour, hour and uh, earned herself a few buttons. And then we went over to the McGovern headquarters uh, on the same day. And uh, son of a gun, but they needed workers too. And uh, that was their charge <laughs> for the buttons. And uh, we, we always like to say that uh, uh, we were, may have been the only two people in America who campaigned for Nixon and McGovern on the same day uh, by telephone. <laughs> so I was wondering me. if a Watergate story was coming in there somehow. No, but, no, yeah, okay. no, no, right. no, 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 no. We, we never made it to Washington. Uh, but we didn't make the big show, as they say. Yeah. But uh, we went on to, uh, uh, you know, we both were interested in collecting. But uh, uh, I then about, uh, I guess it was about three years after that, um, went to Pennsylvania to visit my grandmother. And I got into their attic. And if you know anything about those northeastern attics, you know, when you, when you you didn't know what to do with something. It didn't go to the garbage. It went in the attic. And my grandfather collected everything. And unfortunately, he passed away about five years before I was born because we were kindred spirits. Uh, he he would have, you know, he was Depression era, so he would have had balls of string, you know, where he would just roll them up and constantly <laughs> make them bigger. And then when he'd find a different piece of string, he'd just attach it and keep rolling it. So you'd have all these <laughs> mishmash of, of different strings attached. And, and, 
I mean, it just went on and on. There was just all kinds of stuff like that. Balls of tin foil. He'd pull the tin off of, uh, uh, it was real tin back in those days on gum wrappers, and he'd have these big balls of tin because, you know, someday you might need to cash that in to, to buy food or whatever. So, but anyways, he had a knife collection, a gun collection, um, all kinds of things. Indian arrowheads, Indian pottery. Wow. And I remember, um, I, I mean, history intrigued me at that age anyway and I remember going up there early one morning the rest of the family was still sleeping but the, you know what those attics are like they're dark they're dingy they have like a little window in each end and the light was coming in and you could see the the you know I'm, I'm trying to draw a picture here but you could see the uh, the dust in the air you oh, know yeah. and I remember looking at all this stuff and he had all these books and things and I opened up this uh, old wooden cigar box and inside it was about probably 20 maybe 25 uh, turn of the century campaign buttons. And um, there was one <laughs> right on top, an uh, inch and a quarter pin, uh, just a sepia color uh, pin of uh, Teddy Roosevelt with a metal frame around it. And then hanging from it was just a little uh, red, white, and blue ribbons. They didn't say anything on them. And it was just his name underneath the, the button. And uh, so I was like, oh, I really got interested in him. And then after uh, a few years later, after I got married, and uh, my wife saw all the campaign buttons that were starting to pile up. She said, you know, you really ought to try to specialize in something. And at that point, <laughs> I had read Nathan Miller's book on, on Roosevelt, yep. his vol one volume uh, biography. And uh, I thought, you know, I, I could really get into Theodore Roosevelt. And, and so I decided to narrow it down to that. But then she didn't realize how many different items there were for Theodore Roosevelt out there. <laughs> <laughs> she thought she was narrowing you down. But, and yeah. 43 years later, we're still married. So, Tom, besides the, uh, the basic campaign button that most folks are probably familiar with, uh, what other types of collectibles are, are out there for Theodore Roosevelt? Well, you know, that I, I used to collect uh, coins as a kid. I collected Indian head pennies, and I got them all. And it's like, okay, well, this is every mint market. Every year they made them. Now what do I do? I'm really not interested in moving up to nickels. So I started getting into the campaign buttons, and um, there's just no end to it. I mean, I, I could tell you once a month I see something for Theodore Roosevelt from his lifetime, a collectible, that I've never seen before. It, it's just remarkable. Besides the buttons and ribbons, there's all kinds of textiles, which would be bandanas and handkerchiefs and flags. There's china. There's tokens, metal tokens, figurines, busts. Uh, tobacco-related items, even though he wasn't a smoker, uh, you know, crystal, uh, postcards, posters, and every kind of paper you could ever think of, from ballots to sample ballots, uh, you know, anything that a campaign headquarters might put out. You know, go to a campaign headquarters now and see all the stuff for Biden or Trump, and, you know, just yeah. imagine all that for Theodore Roosevelt at different campaign headquarters around the country. I mean, in, in, in one county, there might be five different, you know, TR campaign clubs, so, you know, uh, I've got flags for him. I, I've got some, I've got advertising posters. There's, you know, there's a great one for, uh, for uh, Cylinder Records. Uh, Hear the President's mm. Voice, it says on it with a big picture of TR. Mm. And um, opening of expositions, there's a great poster for the opening of the Jamestown Exposition. Uh, it, it, it gets as far as, uh, this is a crazy thing I, I just got a couple years ago. But TR opened the Jamestown Exposition in 1903 um, by pushing a, a, a button. Basically, it set off a bell or opened a gate. Who knows what it did, but it's brass. And uh, it's, it says right on the thing, uh, opening of the, the Jamestown Exposition by President Theodore Roosevelt. I've got the brass plate with the button. Wow. You know, it turned up at a political collectible show. So that's the closest I get is to anything he ever owned himself. But, you know, it, it's just uh, remarkable how much stuff is out there. And um, I'm, I'm limited on the number of buttons I can still find when I go to a show uh, because I have a lot of them now. But new ones turn up all the time and then different types of things. Uh, that chalkware piece I just got this week, my sixth one. Um, there's photo albums, uh, like a family would put all their photos in with celluloid fronts on them uh, and color pictures. And uh, I now have five different ones with Theodore Roosevelt or his family on them. I picked up two of them at a show in Canton, Ohio last October. Yep. Uh, so it, it's just, I could sit here and talk forever. I've, I've got a friend who's got 
keeps a list of different types of items that you can have for anybody's campaign, not just Theodore wow. Roosevelt. You know, combs and hats, and you know, each each one of them is a different category. He just keeps a list, and I think he was well over 160 or 180 different items uh, for different campaigns. Uh, so it, it, that's that's the beauty of uh, political collecting is it, there's uh-huh. no end to it, yeah. as my wife would tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, I think you had mentioned having one piece that was the backdrop for a theater, like the, a canvas painted. Oh, no, um, it was the, um, I have a chair. Um, I, I, I don't remember the, oh, I, I did have a, I did, uh, yeah, this, this one had to go by the wayside to another collector because it was uh, uh, approximately nine feet long yeah. and about seven feet wide. It was a big canvas thing of the charge of the Rough Riders up, up San Juan Hill. And I, I'm not sure what it was used for, but it was like it was, it was an advertisement for a play or something. Okay. And um, you, like you see the big old circus posters that were on canvas, that were painted yeah. on canvas. So that's what this was. Um, the other thing I was thinking of was I've kind of... Yeah, this is this is an odd one. Um, the Roosevelt Theater in St. Louis was torn down years ago, and at the end of it, you know, picture the old wooden uh, theater chairs that you know that are incredibly uncomfortable. They would just fold down, you know, and you'd sit on it. Well, at the end of each row, one chair at the end of each row would have the end on it, and it would have had a picture or an image in the cast iron of Theodore Roosevelt. He was molded right into the cast iron. And it was only the end chair in each row. So if it was 30-row theater, there were 60 of them, you know. Yeah. And uh, I have one of those chairs because each one came apart. You know, they were all uh, bolted together. But then the end one, uh, it was it was sold at an auction in St. Louis years ago, and yeah, they shipped it all the way to me in Florida. Uh, it was, it was <laughs> wonderful. And, and the shipping was expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I know in our town, town where I teach in Springfield, Ohio, they have Roosevelt Middle School. And when they tore down the original building, right. James Frazier's plaque, the bronze that you see, they had oh. one of those. And one of my friends went to the auction and was able to get that. I didn't know that was coming up for sale. And asked me if I would be interested in it. So I now yeah. own the one that was at our Theodore Roosevelt Middle School. <laughs> yeah, there's. It's funny. There's a there's a uh, a poster of Roosevelt that uh, turns up occasionally. Um, I'm guessing it's probably uh, maybe 14 by 18 or something like that. And it's just a a, a picture of a close up of him, like from right right below shoulder level and i you know i always thought well, why are there so many of these out there i keep finding them and then i found one day a little card that's about uh, probably f- uh, four by six and it's got a picture of theodore roosevelt on it and it's got one little button attached to it mm-hmm. and it it the button is the same picture that's in that poster and and the writing on it it says you know you want to win one of these posters for yourself and for your school sell all these <laughs> buttons on this oh. card and so it was a school thing that kids would sell the buttons or anybody I guess but it was specifically for schools and, and kids to go out and you know raise money by selling those little buttons uh, so you know there's you know you talk about how many different things are out there I've probably just named 20 and, and I've barely that's a drip in the bucket yeah well that ties in with the question I've got what are some of the most interesting and representative pieces from each of TR's campaigns Oh, gosh. <clears throat> if you want to go all the way back to assembly, uh, you know, there's a little trade card. Uh, it's got a caricature on one side of it and an, an advertisement on the other. Uh, I unfortunately do not own one of those, but one of your, if one of your listeners has it, uh, I'm uh, in the market to buy. But uh, that is out there. And then, you know, you move on to mayoral, and there's not much mayoral stuff. But I have, uh, I know of four different mayoral type items uh, advertising him for his mayoral campaign and I have three of them Uh, one of them is a ribbon from the uh, Republican Club of the city of New York and it just says Rose and it says that at the top and then at the bottom it says Roosevelt and reform and the reason you know it's mayoral is because that was his only reform campaign in fact if you go back and read through the old New York Times you'll see talks about reform constantly and um 
also the other telltale sign is uh, Republican Club of New York has a, a hyphen in New and York. Uh, mm. And I checked with the Historical Society in New York. They dropped that hyphen in their name in November of 1892. So it had to be before that date. So the 1886 wow. makes sense as a mayoral <laughs> ribbon. Then I also have a, a trifold mailer uh, that was actually mailed to somebody in New York City. And I believe wow. the date of it is October 30th, 1886. And it invites you, it's all, you know, uh, printed, not, not hand printed, but, you know, printed on a printing press. Uh, inside, uh, uh, you're invited to the uh, movement to, you know, for, for Theodore Roosevelt, the Honorable Theodore Roosevelt as mayor of New York City, blah, blah, blah. It was basically inviting you to a campaign event. And uh, it, it's like the size of a postcard, except it trifolds into that size. And uh, so that's a pretty neat piece. Uh, I've got that framed with glass on both sides so you can see it was actually sent uh, to somebody in New York. And then um, the last piece I have is a front page of the New York Times, October 30th, uh, 1886. And uh, I don't know if this was everywhere in the New York Times or just on certain editions, but it printed in red letters down the, the, the margin on the very far right-hand side, uh, it says uh, something along the lines, I'm trying to remember the exact wording now, but uh, urging you to cast your vote for Roosevelt and throw the rascals out. And it's in red <laughs> letters down the edge of the newspaper. So they obviously paid the New York Times to on, the, on its front wow. page to, to put down the, the side uh, that, that wording. Um, and then I have another friend uh, who has a, um, a ribbon that's a different ribbon than mine for mayor. And uh, that one actually says for mayor on it. Uh, so I'm a little jealous of him. But, uh, <laughs> so that's the mayoral stuff. I, I get a little carried away there. Um, gubernatorial is really fascinating because the gubernatorial stuff is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is um, stuff that he's represented as a rough rider. Mm -hmm. Almost, I, I would say 95% of the gubernatorial buttons and, and items, paper, whatever, has him uh, as a rough rider uh, in his uniform. So that stuff is really fascinating. And then when he was running for vice president, he's on a ton of buttons and posters and everything with McKinley. But there's also some that are just, this is to tell you something about McKinley, how exciting he was. Uh, there's some buttons that are just for vice president. And they say, you know, uh, and one of them is Theodore Roosevelt standing in, in full uniform. And it says for vice president, Theodore Roosevelt. And then 1904, you know, just a ton of stuff out there, it, it, hundreds of different buttons, because cities would make up their own buttons, uh, like a Republican Club of New York, or the uh, Peoria, Illinois Republican Club, or Theodore Roosevelt Club of Schenectady, whatever, um, they would put out their own buttons and stuff. So you find, we find new stuff all the time that we've never seen before, that comes out of somebody's Pennsylvania attic, probably. Um, and then um, you move on to 1912, and it gets really fascinating because of the whole Progressive Party uh, mm. uh, incident. <laughs> and mm. uh, there's just there's stuff you could find that was before that, you know, before like primary things. And then you could find all the progressive stuff. And there was just all kinds of things put out, buttons and uh, China, all kinds of things. So, um, and and then uh, there's actually uh, I've, I think I have six or seven different buttons from 1916, but the, a lot of folks wanted him to run in, in uh, 1916. So uh, there's, there's it, you know, they're not common, but they're out there. And then finally, uh, memorial items uh, mm -hmm. for uh, his death. And, I, you know, I have skipped over things where he didn't run for office. You know, yeah. the, the opening of the Panama Canal, you know, there's a button, a great button, a, a map that shows the Panama Canal, and it says, the door that Rosie Velt, V-E-L-D-T, <laughs> Velt as in a, a swamp or a field, you know. And huh. uh, so, th there's, and, and then, you know, I've got a... Um, uh, I've got a pair, uh, it's, it's, it's funny, it fits into your mouth, and it looks like you've got a great big smile on your face. It's metal, and it just looks like Teddy's teeth. And at the bottom, in tiny letters, it says Teddy's teeth. And in the back, the part you hold with your teeth, um, it used to have a little piece of waxed uh, cardboard in it, and you would hum like a kazoo, and you'd go down the street, and you know, it, whether it's in a parade or whatever. And I always thought that that was probably from the 1904 campaign, but mm -hmm. there's a book uh, that... that is all about uh, T.R. as police commissioner uh, from, I think it was 1895 to 97. And in that, in one of the pages, it talks about 
the kids outside of his office have these metal teeth in their mouth and they're mm-hmm. humming songs. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that really dates it uh, to that period. So it, it's kind of neat to I actually have something other than an autograph that's uh, from his police commissioner days. Yeah. Well, so kind of along those same lines, you know, the, the imagery that is evoked in some of these political items, uh, I, I don't know if it was it... Um, Conan O'Brien, who called TR the original meme, um, you know, so <laughs> with the... Uh, Is he riding a bull moose in it? <laughs> well, right. So, but, you know, all it takes, you know, to evoke Theodore Roosevelt is just uh, some pince-nez, some you know, mustache, and, yeah. and some teeth. And teeth. Uh, people automatically know what you're talking about so i was hoping that you'd bring up the teeth thing yeah. I, I saw that in the smithsonian in, in um amongst their political items there and uh i, yeah, I thought that was one of the coolest there's pieces a great button um that i got a few years ago from 1912 and um it's it's basically just teeth and glasses and eyes, and, and it's just black and white, but around it it says, if you were against me, you were a crook. <laughs> so it's like, you, you, if you're against me, that means you've stolen the, the nomination from me, and, and you're a crook. Yeah. So, uh, but, it, you, know, it, you know, it's him just because of the, yeah. the, you know, the teeth and the, the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious, what's the holy grail? What's the rarest of TR's collectibles? Oh, that, that that is a tough one um, because new stuff turns up all the time. Probably one of the best ones is a pin that shows um, TR at the gate, uh, and it, it's like a like a, a wooden gate. And uh, Uncle Sam is standing there, and he can lift up each of the panels, and each of the panels says something on it. I can't remember the exact one, but it's like prosperity and something else, wow. and whatever and one of them maybe equality or something like that i'm sorry i just don't remember the exact wording but it's there's a lot of thought that uh, it might be uh trying to bring the south and the north back together that's what uncle sam is opening the gate wow. you know because <laughs> it's still a few years after the civil war you know or within lifetimes of most people mm-hmm. and um the the thought is maybe it was supposed to be the mason dixon line you know that uh-huh. that's speculation but uh, there's some uh, there's some things to back it up and uh that pin is i think the last time i saw it auction was uh, 16 to 20,000 i think it it's pretty scarce uh, but oh. uh that would probably be the, the most valuable thing i could think of right offhand that that isn't something he owned i don't get into you know yeah. this was TR's comb and <laughs> these are four pieces of hair that his barber saved in you know 1903 so I, you know, I'm I'm more into just stuff that represented him in his lifetime, or or at his death, you know, the memorial items. Well, I know one piece you have. You sent a picture of it to us, and we'll post that on the website. Is the photograph of Theodore Roosevelt with an autograph underneath of it? Yeah, this will this will fall under the category of uh, what's your favorite way to to find something and. To be honest with you, I don't know how the woman got my name, but this would have been probably about 1990 or 91. And um, a woman, a very old woman, uh, was late 80s, I believe, contacted me, and she was living in Baltimore. And she said, I've got, uh, you know, I would put my name out there in advertising, whatever, I collect Theodore Roosevelt. And she had seen one of those ads or, or a card or something somewhere, and she contacted me and she said, you know, I'm getting up in age. I have had this item forever and it needs to go to a good home. And it sounds, after we talked for about half an hour, she said, Did, you, you sound like the home that this should go to. Mm-hmm. And I made her an offer on it. It's a, a picture of Theodore Rosa, a real picture, but it's an odd picture. It's a, a profile picture mm-hmm. of him. <clears throat> and, and on the matting right below it, it says, uh, I can't tell you the exact wording, but something to, uh, to L. William Hones uh, and his wife, I believe it is, um, with hearty good wishes. And it says in parentheses, and including the teddy bear, uh, in parentheses, Theodore Roosevelt. And it's signed full signature while he was president in 1907. And... To the best of my knowledge, uh, I have not been able. I mean, if somebody knows it, I hope they pass it along to you all. I've never seen him mention the teddy bear in his own handwriting anywhere, mm. 
and it's the only thing I know of that has it. But the interesting part of the story to me is the woman had gotten it in 1948 um, at the uh, Johns Hopkins University white elephant sale. They would have a white elephant sale each year <laughs> to basically raise money. And I guess she worked for the committee and she saw it come in and, uh, and she just fell in love with it. And yeah. her husband bought it for her at the auction and uh, i have no idea what he paid back then he probably got it for a song but uh <laughs> anyway it was um something that that she cherished and i've now been the caretaker of it for i think it's been 33 years and uh uh don't know where it ends up someday but uh uh, it's. I think it's very historical because you know. I think the whole teddy bear thing kind of embarrassed him a little bit. To mm-hmm. be honest with you, He's, he, you know, yeah. he couldn't figure out what what use his name would be for a, for a toy <laughs> bear, and uh, we still have them to this day. You know, I'm, I don't know if that c- falls into this category, but um, of all of the items in your collection, do you have a couple that you would point to as uh, favorite children in your collection? That's difficult always uh, because uh, I look at one thing and I think, oh, this is my favorite. And then I look at, you know, I I just have to look around the wall in my my room uh, what might be my favorite. But uh, besides the the photograph I just mentioned and the reason I mentioned that so prominently because it is one of my probably top five. But I just acquired a chalkware piece this week um, and that gives me six different ones now. Uh, but my favorite ones, uh, these are these are actually made out of like a chalk-like material, so they, they're very easily chipped. And this one is about uh, 12 inches long, and I would guess maybe 8 inches high, and it's TR wearing his Rough Rider hat, and he is riding on a bull moose, and he is holding a wow. big stick in his hand, and he is clubbing an elephant and a donkey, which he is running over wow. top of on the moose. And this is all carved or somehow made out of, I don't know, it's probably molded out of chalk, uh, basically. And, but the best part of it is at the very bottom, well, it's obviously a 1912 piece because of the moose, you know, running over the Republican and the Democratic symbols. But at the bottom, it's got his quote, which was his last line at the Progressive Convention speech, uh, accepting the nomination, uh, we stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. Um, and then on the back of it is carved into it, into the chalkware from, it's from the 1912, I think it's the New York State Progressive Party and the name of the secretary of the wow. party, et cetera. So, uh, but that, uh-huh. that piece has just been special forever. A, a oh, friend yeah. found it probably 95 around that time at, at a political collectible show in Austin, Texas. And um, another friend told me about it and I called the guy. He said, oh yeah, yeah, I don't want to give it up, you know. And I said, okay, okay. Three months later, he wanted to give it up. So <laughs> whether he had bills to pay or whatever became of it, I don't yeah. know why, but I have cherished it ever since. And uh, those are two of my favorite pieces. And, and I say this uh, knowing that I have a thousand different Teddy Roosevelt uh, pinback buttons and ribbons, and yet two of my favorite pieces are not buttons or ribbons. Well, that's funny. That one item rolls in so much of the imagery associated with oh, TR. Yeah. yeah, it's got you know, it's got everything: the big stick, the moose, the donkey, yeah. the quote. Uh, it's just uh, just really special. I know I know of uh, at least one other one, maybe two other ones. Uh, there are probably some out there, but they're very brittle. I mean, they, you know, chalkware mm-hmm. is is stuff that just breaks so easily. I mean, just tap it down on the table too hard and it can crack. I know at one point they would give those away as prizes from carnivals yep. and festivals. Yes. And, yeah. yeah. The, I've got one that's got TR in a safari hat, and it just says TR in Africa on the bottom. And then another one is just a close-up of TR's face with this ghastly you know, teeth looking at you, <clears throat> you know, 90% of the face seems to be teeth and it just says <laughs> Teddy at the bottom, you know, like you needed that. Well, we know from your biography, Tom, that you, you're associated with this organization called the American Political Items Collectors uh, so as a uh, nonprofit organization that's focused on political collectibles uh, with various conferences uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit more about that organization and, and your role in that? I would be happy to. I, I would say if you want to collect uh, 
political items seriously, you have to belong to the American Political Items Collector. For $42 a year, uh, you get a monthly newspaper. It's usually, I think, 24, 28 pages. And then um, I'll plug the Keynoter magazine. Full Color Magazine comes out quarterly, and I happen to be editor of that. But that is also included in that, and that's usually either 32 or 36 pages. And it's all about campaigns and collectibles. More about the collectibles related to the campaign, but also what's the history behind behind that campaign button that may have, you know, it may say Freeport, Illinois, October 26, 1904, and then you can go on newspapers.com or somewhere and look up uh, the, and read about the, what actually happened that day. So somebody wearing that button that day was there. And that's the kind of information you get through APIC. Um, I will say that the the website is is up to date, but it's outdated in a sense. Any day now, the new website will be going up, and it, it'll have amazing. It's got our Keynote magazine on there um, way back, uh, uh, dozens of years, uh, that you'll be able to search. Uh, but again, you will need to be a member to, to get behind that paywall to see it. But there's other information that's not behind the paywall. Uh, so apic.us is... Uh, uh, I, it may be the only .us uh, uh, website I know of, but uh, uh, it's easy for those of the, the organization to remember, and I would advise people to go on there and, and take a look around. Besides that, APIC holds uh, political collectible shows around the country. Um, I run one in South Florida, even though I don't live there anymore. I'm still running it down there uh, once a year, and it was just a couple weeks ago. And uh, I went uh, before that, I went to one in New Jersey, uh, there was one in Austin, Texas last month. So uh, they're all over the country from California to New England uh, down to Florida. And those shows are all sponsored by the American Political Items Collectors. And then every other year um, on the election year, uh, so that would be this year, uh, we have uh, a, a national convention. And uh, this one is going, our last one was in Reno, Nevada. And before that was Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, our, our one coming up this year is going to be in uh, Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, Seven Springs Ski Resort. Um, not a lot of skiing going on in August, so that's a good time for us to meet there. <laughs> and uh, it, it's going to show, uh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll have, we're guessing, 250 to 300 tables of uh, political items for sale or trade. And wow. it'll, it'll have people from uh, practically every state in the, the nation. And, and that show not only will have all this, these items for sale for three days, but it, there's seminars on uh, everything from how to tell a fake button from a real one to uh, estate planning uh, for your, what are you going to do with your collection when you uh, get to that age where something needs to be done with your collection? <laughs> like how, how much could we get for this collection in scrap metal? Uh, oh, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we all we all have fear that uh, uh, when something happens to us, it, it goes in a dumpster. So uh, <laughs> I make sure my wife knows the value of items. <laughs> there's just all kinds of other events. There's display rooms where some of the members will bring their very best items and uh, just have them for display. Uh, so uh, it it uh, those conventions. Anytime you can go to a political collectible show in your area, it's it, uh, you know it's it's amazing. I, I've said I go to some people's houses and look at their collections, and uh, there's a couple in particular. If I had a choice of going to the Smithsonian or going to their house, I'd go to their house every time. <laughs> it's just it, they just have so much stuff and so much good early items that that you know you don't get to see even at the Smithsonian because a lot of it's in storage. Yeah. I'm not bad-mouthing the Smithsonian. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy it every time I go there. <laughs> there was uh, one more thing I wanted to mention. We were talking about uh, the APIC site. Uh, there's a Facebook page that I run. Uh, it's called Theodore Roosevelt Chapter of the American Political Items Collectors. Uh, if you just go on, if you're on Facebook, just go on there and put in Theodore Roosevelt Chapter American Political Items Collectors, and uh, it's basically just a place for all Theodore Roosevelt collectors to get together. And we'll post stuff on there all the time, photos of you know, has anybody ever seen this button before, this flag before, mm -hmm. or whatever. And uh, you can just scroll down, and I think there's actually a tab up at the top you can click on just images and just look at the variety of things that are out there that uh, people sometimes people just like to post stuff from their collection say hey look at this neat item i found or yeah. whatever and uh, i would highly recommend uh, uh you know there's no cost to that um but uh, just go on and join that facebook page i'll be happy to let you through and uh 
and then you can just look at the items that are in there. We keep, uh, one thing we do, uh, especially as an APIC thing, is we don't get into politics. I know that sounds weird, but we, we even on all the Facebook pages for APIC and others, we, we discourage any political talk, especially current era. Now, you may talk about, you know, uh, Clay versus Jackson or somebody in the 1800s. <clears throat> that really doesn't make much difference today. But we don't get into Trump versus Biden or, or yep. anything like that uh, because that just leads to hard feelings. And we're, first of all, we're collectors and we're his- historians. Uh, we're saving this history, you know, that might yeah. be thrown in the dump. People, uh, of course, have their own political views, um, but uh, we keep that to ourselves. So besides the APIC, if someone wanted to start collecting Theodore Roosevelt items, what advice would you give them? Oh, gosh. I would probably tell them don't because you're just uh, going to be a competition <laughs> for me. But, uh, you know, I've, I've heard that Nixon stuff is really popular and a lot cheaper. So, no, I, uh, you know, probably uh, attend antique shows, you know, and, and don't wait till the last day of the show. Get there early because the political stuff is hard to find and it gets scooped up quickly. But go to antique shows, uh, go to flea markets. Flea markets are, are wonderful, especially if you mm-hmm. live in the Midwest or Northeast. Uh, it's just a lot of old stuff comes out of those uh, attics like my grandfather's. Um, get, get yourself a little business card printed. They aren't that expensive that just says wanted or I collect and then a picture of a couple of campaign buttons. And you might want to specialize. You might want to just say, I collect political campaign items, you know, mm-hmm. and your, your email and your phone number on it. Um, the, you know, the, the most important thing is get your name out there. You know, there's, there's other Theodore Roosevelt collectors, but, I, you know, I've reached that age where I've been doing it so long now. And, and some of the, the ones that were more well-known than me have, have passed along that uh, I'm kind of the TR guy. Now, there are others out there. Don't get me wrong. And they're, they're, they're glaring at me right now, I'm sure, when they, they hear this. But, you know, if you, if you pass out enough cards to people and bug enough people and keep telling them what you collect, uh, they'll remember you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I still have an AOL uh, email address. And the reason is because every antique picker in the country, I think, has my email address. And heaven forbid I should go to Gmail and they can't find me anymore, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, so I, I keep that same uh, uh, TR buttons at AOL.com email address. And it, I, I'm embarrassed and my son cringes every time he, uh, he sees me <laughs> giving that out. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it, it works for me. So, uh, you know, it just, it just, it, it's not, you can't just say, oh, I collect political and then hope it, it falls into your lap. It, you, there's a lot of collectors of it out there who are serious and, and will scoop up the stuff as soon as they can find it. So I just, you know, just keep looking. And uh, if, if you join APIC, there's all kinds of information there about um, uh, the fakes. Uh, we call yeah. them brummagem. It, it's the, there's some that are actual reproductions of old buttons that look the same, but you'll learn by AP, through APIC what what's the difference in the construction. Basically, we say turn the button over. You know, look at the back. That that's a telltale sign of the age uh, of the button uh, is what's on the back, and you'll learn certain kinds of buttons were made in certain time periods. Um, you know, my first button I bought. Uh, was at a flea market and it was uh, Wilson and Marshall from 1916 and I was so excited about it and uh, I uh, later in the week I turned it over in tiny tiny letters it said Kleenex tissues on the back curl (laughs) and uh, I realized that I was out $16 and as a 16 or 17 year old back then that was a lot of money and uh, so I learned my lesson but you can you can learn that lesson through APIC and not having to, to make that costly mistake as a youngster. Well, I think probably a lot of folks may get into political collecting who are interested in history. And, I mean, it's kind of a, a subset of, of antique collecting. It's that Certainly. tangible piece of history, right? Yeah, you, you'd be surprised how many of our uh, members are either uh, teachers or lawyers because the, the, the law and politics kind of goes together. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> a lot of teachers, though, and a lot of them use the items in their classrooms. Um, you know, I, I, Larry, you may have even done that, and I know a couple of friends of mine in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, yeah. uh, they, they love to take items in, and, and, you know, there's something about sitting in a history class, and, you know, people say, oh, all you do is memorize dates. Uh, as I tell my wife when we're watching Jeopardy, the date is the clue uh, yeah. to, to the answer, you know, all the time. It's like, okay, what could have happened in 1884, you know, or what could have yeah. happened in 1931? But, 
at the same time, uh, you, you you learn about the events uh, through the. To me, you learn about it by looking at the items. Uh, it it was always interesting to me in history books to see old pictures of campaigns and things like that. And uh, you know, I could I could sit and. It's funny. There's some buttons for Teddy Roosevelt that 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 same button that you'll see ten of them in different collections, and they all have what we call foxing around the edge, which is a little <laughs> darkening because water has seeped through from the backside. And you you go on newspapers.com or somewhere and find out you know where that button was that day, and look at the weather report. It rained that day, you know. Yeah. And, and it, so, but it, it's you can imagine people standing there in their their raincoats wearing these buttons, listening to. Theodore Roosevelt speak you know there's something about holding that in your hand that's why I'm only interested in things from his era you know after after the memorial 19 19 19 20 um, I really don't have any interest in it because uh, it's just I I like the things that I know that he might have been there for it or at least they were representing him at the time not representing something that happened in the past it's that tangible material culture that you can own that little piece of that right. political past and and yeah you it it is fun and interesting to to think about that original holder uh, of that of yeah. that item and i i think you, you'd mentioned the the keynoter provides some background and context to absolutely uh, to the collections Another thing that makes it interesting, sometimes you'll get a campaign button and it'll be attached to a, a piece of paper and it's got, you know, grandma whoever's name on it, you know, and it, it says, you know, I, I wore this at the campaign for Theodore Roosevelt in Norristown, Pennsylvania in 1903 or 1904 or whatever. And uh, it, it, that's even better, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it just kind of, I, I get a little excited here. It, it brings history alive when you when you see items mm-hmm. that were that were there. And that's why I, I think... I wish more teachers uh, than do collect so at least a few things because there's a lot of stuff out there. You, you know, you could buy a Theodore Roosevelt button for ten, fifteen dollars still, uh, or spend thousands. But you know, to have something representative of him for your classroom, it doesn't cost you much more than uh, a couple of packages of uh, of wipes or something that you'd use in yeah. a classroom or crayons or whatever. From an historian's point of view, I think Larry and I have both experienced that in the classroom. How uh, physical items, material culture, um, allows students to make those connections. And you bring in one button yeah. that says 16 to 1. And, right. you know, without any context, just throw that out there and and use that as a conversation starter with students about mm-hmm. when the, you know, this, this is from a political uh, campaign. What in the world do you suppose this means? And it it's a great inroad right it, it, it gets you into the into one of the the key issues of of campaigns from the late 1800s right and yeah. the gold standard versus silver funny you mentioned that you can hear the chuckle in my voice i have a um a railroad clock hanging on the wall in my uh, dining room which we just finally got put up it was my grandfather's uh the one i didn't ever get to meet um because of course he collected everything but he worked for the pennsylvania railroad so it's an old railroad clock that we just hung up in the living room or in the dining room and it, it's not working right now because I don't have a key for it. I got to find the right key to, to wind it. It's one of those, I think, what they call them, eight day clocks or something. Yeah. And, uh, but it, I set the time at 16 to one. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, you may not want to spill the beans, but uh, you can Google 16 to one and uh, 1896 uh, yep. and you'll, uh, you'll find lots of information about uh, what 16 to one means. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's what the clock is set at right now in my, my dining room. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, I was thinking that when we talk about the imagery of a button, I've uh, been reading a couple of books on Theodore Roosevelt's relationship with Booker T. Washington, you know, guest of honor, mm-hmm. and then there's a there's another recent book on this. And in doing a couple of searches online, come across the uh, the button from 1902. There's that image of Theodore Roosevelt sitting at the dinner table with Booker T. Washington with one word underneath the table. And what is that word? Equality. Equality. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me tell you, I, I, this was not set up, but uh, you, you, you did me a favor here. Uh, the next Keynoter magazine that is going to press April 1st or be mailed April 1st uh, from the APIC is all about the equality button. The cover story is about oh. that. We we do multiple things, but there were actually I think it was all together uh, maybe 
seven or eight different equality buttons. They, sometimes the images were different. And the thought was that some of them were pro and some of them were anti. Uh, the one comes from the Chicago area, the original one. But then there were, there's one that shows TR and Booker T. Washington sitting at a table. And um, uh, Booker T. Washington is much more prominent in it. And, and the water decanter has been replaced by a liquor bottle in, in the, in the <laughs> photo. And, and, and Booker T. Washington has his arms slung over the back of the chairs if he's very casual with the president. And there was thoughts that... Uh, that may have been uh, come out of Tennessee or somewhere in the South and was an anti-TR button. Wow. But uh, our, our research through old newspapers uh, from the guy who wrote the story um, has found basically that these were made in different parts of the country and they were, uh, they were actually worn more as anti-buttons be in, in certain wow. areas. Mm -hmm. uh, the black population would wear them as a, as a proud moment. You know, here's Booker yeah. T. Washington having dinner at the White House. And then in other areas, the Democrats would wear them and say, okay, look at, you know, this is, this is what you're going to get if, you know, wow. we have equality. And then, you know, the, they were originally made to be a, a, a proud moment for the president, but the, uh, there weren't a lot of Republicans wearing them at the time because it became a kind of a derogatory thing so it, it just depends on who was wearing them and what the button wow. meant and that's basically what our our story in the keynote is going to say so if you, you pay wow. that 42 dollars quickly you can get on that mailing list <laughs> <laughs> okay our listeners are going to assume that was a setup question but i assure yeah. you that was I, pure it was not it yeah. was <laughs> not it, it, uh, <laughs> so one thing you mentioned with that was the political context of that button when you study different campaigns, not just Theodore Roosevelt. Is there a way to study history and just looking at the memorabilia for different oh, gosh. campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Kurt mentioned the 16 to 1. Uh, I will spoil it here. That was uh, the 1896 and a little bit in 1900 too, the the issue between the Republicans and the Democrats, boy, you think issues are boring today. It was whether the, the money should be based on gold, uh, one part, you know, basically gold, or 16 equal value would be 16 parts silver. And uh, uh, bimetallism, they called that. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you see 16 to 1. I see 16 to 1 on anything for whatever reason. I, I, imagine, I think of that campaign. You know, Adlai Stevenson, uh, in the in the fifties, was running for president against Ike, and he was on a platform, and he crossed his legs, and people could see a hole in the bottom of his shoe uh, where it was worn through. And Ike made a big deal about it on campaign buttons and posters that said, you know, if you want to end up like this, vote for Stevenson. And then Stevenson turned it around and said, this is how hard I work. I'm always on my feet, basically. You know, so you know, you see a, ho a shoe with a hole in it, and and, and you know it's either an Ike or a Stevenson button. Uh, and there's all kinds of things like that, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a chicken in every pot. There's all kinds of campaign slogans mm -hmm. that, that don't swap horses, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you, you see no third term, you know it's a Wilkie button from 1940 against FDR. Uh, yeah. th those campaign slogans are always out there. Um, you know, Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, you know, th those slogans uh, end up on campaign buttons and posters and all kinds of things. So there are people who just collect slogans like that. Uh, on, they don't mm -hmm. collect a particular candidate. Yeah. Now, you know, some people are just general collectors. They, they collect everything. And, and some will just, some, I've got one guy I know just collects golf-related things to presidents because Taft was a golfer, yeah. you know, and Ike was a golfer. And, and there's uh, a guy who just collects train things related to campaigns, you know, tickets for, to ride the FDR train west or whatever. So uh, there's so mm -hmm. many ways to narrow your collection uh, to particular things once, once you really get into it. My goal right now and for the past few years is try to get uh, one item from every significant event in his life, you know, that, wow. that, that there are items for. You know, the, I mentioned the one thing from the Panama Canal. I'm still looking for that assembly piece. But, um, you know, I've, when you think about it, I, I've, I've got a button um, and, a, and a ticket to the event or an invitation to the event in Argentina where he spoke on his, uh, his River of Doubt trip. Wow. Uh, he actually spoke at a museum down there. And this is a button I have, uh, the only one I know of, and it, it's actually got back paper in it. It says it was made in, uh, the company has two places in Peru and, and in Argentina where they make buttons, and it, it's in Spanish. It just says, Welcome, uh, Roosevelt. 
on it with his picture. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, that represents the River of Doubt trip, you know, yeah. and, and I try to find something, even like 1916 when he didn't run, uh, uh, there's some buttons for that. So um, that's kind of my goal is just to find something for every major event in his life that items were made for. Yeah. If you have the collecting gene, uh, the variety in political collecting is unsurpassed. Unsur I had, I collected glass telephone insulators. I'm embarrassed to say this, but uh, I collected matchbooks. I collected Indian head pennies. Uh, you name it. I was, I had that gene that my grandfather apparently sent down to me. And uh, um, the, my wife would tell you that other than marrying me. <laughs> And I'm not so sure about the marrying me, but the marrying me and having two sons being born, the happiest day of her life was when the gentleman backed his pickup truck up to our garage in Florida many years ago and loaded all 400 of those glass telephone insulators onto them, and I actually got money for them. So, um, you know, if you, if you have that collecting gene, you just like collecting. You know, we always say if you have one, you have an item. If you have two, you have a collection. So uh, if uh, political yeah. stuff is just such a variety, and it really gets into the history. And, uh, you know, join APIC, uh, APIC.us, the, the website. It's, uh, it's just a remarkable organization where you'll find uh, uh, collectors. Uh, they, they get together on Facebook and buy and sell, too. And uh, yeah. uh, it, it's, you go to a show. It's funny. You could collect your entire life and collect political. And in one show on the first four tables, you'll see more items than you will at every flea market you've ever been to your whole life that are political items. If you, you know, the APIC.us site has a list of when shows are around the country, too, because they're all over the place. You mentioned the collecting gene. I know I have that, and much to Julia's chagrin, my wife. Um, and one thing I've seen that look on her face, Larry. You have. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, she tries to limit me from breakable items. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Tom, we sure appreciate you coming on and, and yeah. giving us and our listeners an education on what goes into collecting Theodore Roosevelt political items. This has been great. We really appreciate you doing this, Tom. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you both having me, and uh, I hope I didn't bore too many people. No. Uh, I get into minutia uh, sometimes on this, and... I get a little excited about it because I love the history, yeah. and uh, that's what I like about the political collecting is you can use your imagination, and you're there, you know, yeah. when you see somebody's collection. Well, we hope you enjoyed this great conversation with one of the nation's leading TR political item collectors, Mr. Tom Peeling. If you'd like to learn more about the TR chapter of the American Political Items Collectors, and if you'd like to see some examples of some of the interesting items that we talked about during this episode, please go to our website talkaboutteddy.com, and look at the show notes under Episode 7, Collecting TR. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. You can find this podcast on our website, talkabouttetty.com, where you can see show notes and transcripts, links to resources, and additional TR content. And please, tell us what you think. If you've enjoyed our content, please consider subscribing and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen and tell your friends and family about us because it really does make a tremendous difference and it helps others find this show. We hope you'll join us for the next episode of Talk About Teddy. And until then, as our friend Colonel Roosevelt would say, Do what you can with what you have where you are. Bullet.